introduction to Jerry Winstrom. I'd like to start with a quote by Rilke, where he says, when I create, I am real. And I want to find the strength to base my entire life on this boundless simplicity and joy that is sometimes offered to me. Now, when I think of Jerry, and I've known Jerry for quite a few years now, I think he is an artist and a man who has really found that courage and found that strength to base his entire life on his artistic vision. And I've had him come in and speak for many of my classes here at Pacifica, and it's always an honor to have him in, and the students always love it. And you guys have had the additional good fortune of being able to read one of his texts. Because given that this is now the Humanities and the Creative Arts Project, bringing those two together, I was able to use Jerry's book as one of the primary texts, and I know you've all had a chance to read it. And so you know some of his story already, and this death rebirth of his creative vision that he has gone through has really left him in a place where he has access to the collective unconscious in a way that not many people do. He very much embodies so much of the theory of depth psychology that we talk about from the point of view, not as an academic, but as an artist. And I find it fascinating, and I'm sure you'll see it in his work, the synchronicities are remarkable that tend to take place around the pieces of art that he's done. And one other thing that I'll say that I find very interesting is that it's like Jerry's life is no longer separate from his artwork. His life is art, and his art is a reflection of life. And I just can't really do justice to the depth and the, how profound that actually is, and how rare that is. So, without further ado, I would really like to introduce you to Jerry Winstrom. <laughs> All those wonderful things are true. It's by accident, not by design. So I'm glad you at least got to read the book. It used to be, when I was in the studio, this desperately driven process where I often describe that time where I was trying to paint my way to heaven and finally to realize you can't get there from here. And it was in the surrender that I feel the real gift came through. So the work has become at one with life when we tend the details of all things. The tendency of an artist is to do what they do as sacred in a certain level in the studio, and then the rest of their lives are usually a mess. And that was certainly how I did it, and it just doesn't hold up. I mean, that's what I discovered. If it were possible, I think I would have succeeded in that attempt because I certainly tried hard enough. But it doesn't. And so after giving art up for many years and the way it has come back, it's just part of a totality where you tend all of the things and there are connections that fall into place, a conversation, an object I might find at our local recycle center will fit perfectly into place or even inspire a whole new piece. And that's the way creation happens now. It can be as simple as someone showing up like this one old person who grew up in England had a little steam roller as a child that was actually a, a steam-driven toy. So you lit a little fire with alcohol, cotton, and it got the steam engine going, and the toy would ride across the floor with flames coming off of it. We should give all of our children these toys. <laughs> He asked if I could fix it, and I took it apart, and I repaired it, and I was so fascinated by how it worked that I decided to create an art piece with a steam engine, which I did. So it can be as simple as that. I think if we live our lives like a prayer, which they are, I mean, we're all praying for something, whether it's like Ramakrishna says, sex and money, or if it's the sacred or the creative or the beauty in life, the love, the connection. If we live our lives like a prayer, then it's all sacred and somehow it all becomes a complete expression. That's what makes us all so unique. If we're not looking around to see how we need to behave by way of templates that other people have created for us, what if we fully accepted that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the mystery where there was no reference point but you and that which is sacred? 
if that were the case, there would be nothing in the world that looked quite like it. Nothing would look like who we are becoming. And that both terrifies us, but it also becomes, if we can live it through, the life well lived, it becomes a complete expression in the world. Most of us want to look like something recognizable, you know, <laughs> doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever. And that's a big danger. Even if it's a position with great integrity, it's still based for the most part on fear of the void, fear of that one-on-one -on -one relationship with that totality. Since most of you are women, you're much more equipped at doing it than us men are because you have a womb, you embody the larger emptiness in time and space. How come there are no men in your class? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out okay. So, <laughs> so this was the first of the box series, and now there are about 20 of them. This one was inspired by, I was actually looking in a book I'm sure you are all familiar with, Jung's Man and His Symbols. It was an early book. There's this painted sarcophagus in there that I just loved and I completely entered it. It entered me that I decided, well, I can't go out and buy one. Why don't I make one? And that's where it started with this piece. And there's an interesting story connected to this, which is the way art and life becomes pretty much seamless. When I was doing this piece, this is the outer shell of it, the outer box. That glass belly is actually a street light, if you look up at a big street light. And behind it is a strobe light, so it lights. And then on the inside is the figure, and so the strobe is in the womb area. But the story behind this, when I finished the external part, I wanted to do a figure inside. And I was riding on our Whidbey Island ferry one day, and a friend asked what I was doing. I told her my project. And since the box is pretty narrow, I wanted to make a mold of someone's body. Now I'm carving all my figures, but this was the first, and it's done with plaster. And I said, you know any really skinny person who I could make a mold of her body and put it in this box? I almost, it was so small, I almost thought, well, I need a child, but you can't exactly ask a child to get naked and cover him with plaster. So she knew just the person. The woman came over and we completely covered her with plaster bandage and then plaster over that. And in the middle of it, she was getting claustrophobic. And one of the friends who was helping was a body worker. And so she picked up pretty quickly on her fear and she began working with her. And so what came out of it, which was very interesting, I didn't know this woman at all. She was very brave to volunteer. And she was so afraid. And I finally said, well, if you need to jump up and smash it, go ahead. And so she knew she could get out instantly if she wanted. So knowing that was enough. So she didn't do it. <laughs> and so we were, I was able to complete the project. And this piece is about birth and death. I mean, you have the pregnant birth, and this is a very death-like image. And what came out of it is that she was going through a really painful divorce and she was pregnant. And part of the process was she really didn't want to be pregnant. It was the worst possible time and she was really struggling with that. And that's all the stuff that came up around the body work. And she went home and she miscarried, which for many would be a really terrible thing. For her, it was this incredible release and healing. So... That whole thing, the fact that a pregnant woman ended up there and all that happened around this, to me, it's the place I know I'm in the right place at the right moment. There aren't many other indicators. I mean, ideas don't hold as well as reality coming in to support our intuition. There's your living prayer. If you're asking and you're watching and you're paying attention rather than coming from your head or your ideas, if you have that relationship with the mystery, what comes through is always so much larger than anything we can strategize or arrange for ourselves. And to me, that's true creation. You know, I love what Campbell says about the creative process, where he says there are three kinds of creation. And sort of the lowest form he calls pornography, 
which is art designed to elicit desire, whether it's advertising or pornographic art. The next layer he calls propaganda, which is art with an intention. Even if it's a good intention, I'm going to do something spiritual. I'm going to do something political. I'm going to do something like the muralist with an idea that's going to change the world. So we go in with an idea, we stick to the idea, we create it. Even with the best of intentions, it's propaganda. And then the third kind and the highest art of all leaves one in awe. It's simply indefinable awe. So what happens in the process for the artist, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, even if it's raising a child or cooking a meal, there's a place where something wacky happens and another reality kicks in and what comes through, everybody agrees, is beautiful. And you don't even know how you got there. And to even claim it, you're getting in your own way. And so that place of awe can only come out of that open questioning in the creative process. It takes a lot of discipline, cultivating of our craft, whatever it is. The most incredible stuff on the planet always comes out of that relationship. And when we are awed by our own arrival, so will the world be with our creation. Okay, this one called Clyde's Emerson. The scent, the upper part, is a 1950s TV. Oh. I don't know if you know the term zoetrope. I think the alchemist kind of came up with them first, the original early alchemist, 17th century. Also, cinema is like a zoetrope or a flip book, you know, those little cartoon books, where it becomes a moving image by way of flipping through. Or in this case, I have images spinning around with a strobe fixing the image. So it looks like inside the TV when you pull that big lever on the right. The image is of actually my wife's mother who volunteered of her face and then her face turns into a skull face. And then this face is going around a very still Buddha. So it's life and death going around a Buddha centeredness. You seem to create situations where people are enabled to touch the work and interact with it. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, when you go into a museum and you see a sculpture and you want to touch it and you're not supposed to, and I, I always am drawn to that. So I think that's, I just find that really interesting. And is that intentional or does it just come out that way? Well, they're all interactive. I think it's so much a part of who I am. I have a, a nephew and one day we were playing this game there were a lot of birds at this bird feeder, and so I started this game going. I said, what kind of bird would Grandpa be? And we were laughing, and so we were naming everyone we knew, comparing to a bird. So finally I said, and what kind of bird would I be? And he just looks at me, and he said, you would be a chickadee. You come in real close, but no one ever tamed you or anything. How old was he? Oh, he was about eight, I think. <laughs> I think when we can get close within ourselves, we no longer fear interaction. What you were saying, you said vulnerability. What makes us vulnerable? Annie Dillard says there's nothing more awesome than a mountain because it's so conspicuous. And why aren't we conspicuous? What is it that we're hiding? And if we don't hide from ourselves, we can't hide from the world. When we depend on the mystery to carry our being, we don't have to carry it and strategize and cover all our bases and live in fear because that's not our foundation any longer. And that thing isn't anything special. I just think it's our birthright. And what is the alternative? When you think of the people you have the hardest time with, it's the people who are the most defensive. They're not the people who are accessible. I don't know. I think, again, by default, my art happened that way because I do come in close and sometimes I push buttons that I shouldn't push. It comes with the territory. But if we're afraid to take those chances, we miss the best part of what we all really want. I mean, think of all the things we do to have friends, but we sabotage those friendships by holding a certain distance. Our image becomes more important than the vulnerability it takes to break through to new levels together. And communication is very interactive in that when it happens, everyone comes more alive. And there's no ego to claim any piece of it. If there's anything, we can be proud that we allowed ourselves the vulnerability to be available and present with another human being. I call this one feminine balance. So it's aspects of the feminine. This is the virgin 
the innocence. And so inside is the dark goddess, the Kali-like figure, which is that aspect of nature that bowls us over, you know, the tower in the Tarot or the Kali or the hurricane that wipes out Louisiana, that expression of the feminine. I mean, doing it, there's something about we all want to be good and think good and look good. And the Bhagavad Gita says goodness is the final obstacle to God. So if it's not goodness, what is it? I mean, who are we? And I think we are the thing, like in alchemy, if you can hold the opposites. What emerges is this transpersonal sense of being that can embrace it all. The Tibetans will put knives and guns in their stupas, which they circumvent and worship, because they're saying that too is part of creation. Instead of being so terrified of things like that, How can I incorporate those experiences into my heart that it's big enough that I could even find the divine in that, which is hard for all of us? How do you love that which is so unlovable? How do you find the perfection in a universe that kills babies or things that are so difficult for us to handle? How do you see the larger part? And, you know, for you guys, especially if you're going to do any kind of work with other people in terms of therapy or that kind of thing, I mean, how do you deal with someone's suffering that was a result of something really horrible they may have done? I mean, how do you see, how do you get out of the idea of what you might be confronted with and see the miracle in it, see even the perfection in that? There's a great image I remembered from the film American Beauty, At one point, this guy commits suicide, and he's a bloody mess lying on the table. And that quirky kid looks at him, and he smiles. And it's almost a moment like that. So here's this horror that would bowl any of us over. And I like to think, how do you see something larger, a mystery, you might say, speaking through the most atrocious possibility? Because we all have bad experiences. Instead of running from them, buffering ourselves from them, How do we incorporate them and find the gift in even that? Because we're all in the best seat in the house and everything that comes is exactly what we need, unconditionally. And if that is true, how do you find that gift if you can't embrace it in that kind of a way? In a lot of ways, creating this art, this kind of thing, is defining that for myself. How do I deal with the atrocious, as Anna calls the intolerable? And that's in the womb area. It's dark creation. It's basically a little doll head that I painted and just put nails. I mean, just that dark creation that comes out of left field and bowls us over, whatever it is. So when you go into creating these, do you um, wait until all the pieces have kind of come to you? Or do you start something and then like this gets added on later after you stumble across the doll head or whatever? It happens as it happens. I never know what I'm doing when I start. I call it wandering. I wander with an openness. And to know is, again, propaganda. If I knew and did it, I wouldn't trust it. I can't feel good about that kind of creation anymore. It just doesn't work for me. It's almost like if I'm not thrown off my idea, then I don't trust it. It doesn't feel honest enough somehow. And so in other words, to be able to say, I don't know, As hard as that is for some of us, I think the best of everything comes out of that. I mean, look at your relationships. You try hard or whatever you try to do. It's often in your failure that the real gift comes through, in the surrender. This piece I call the sacred marriage. And this has a really interesting story. Certainly interesting for me as an experience. I found this large sign carved into the sign. It was an old sign from an animal clinic. It said animal clinic. And I, it was, it's a great thick slab of cedar, old growth cedar, which is really beautiful to carve, much better than the new growth. And so I laid it face down, the whole slab, and I brought it into the studio. And I drew three figures, two one way, one the other, to get the most mileage out of the slab. So I thought I could get three figures out of it. And I cut two out, and as I was cutting the third, the phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was my first love from high school, who I hadn't heard from or seen. 
and she had run across my book. She saw the film, it was a parabola film at that time. And so she knew my whole story, and she's the person in the book that I mentioned, Healing the Bloodline, if you remember that story. That woman is who called, who I hadn't heard from for probably 25, 30 years. And so it was just this incredibly beautiful, surprising, healing phone call. That was the love of my life that most devastated me. I mean, we never love quite the same like we do the first time. I think we wise up a little bit. That was the place where I really got nailed. The healing that came in that story from my book, and then this was just some final little icing on the cake somehow, that connection. After I hung up the phone, I finished cutting out the third figure, and when I did, I didn't know what I was creating. I was just cutting figures. I had no idea what I was doing. And so when I flipped the third figure over, perfectly situated from Animal Clinic was Anima. So I decided to incorporate Anima and turned it into a two-sided door and called it the Sacred Marriage. The head of the second figure flips down. And there's the union of opposites. So this piece I call lightning. And a lot of people call me. This one young guy calls me at 3 o'clock in the morning, even still. I make myself available to whatever happens, and troubled people call me. I'm not a therapist. I don't charge it for anything. I'm just here. There was a woman going through a really difficult divorce. And I worked months with her. I mean, she'd come at the hardest places, and we'd break through these things. And during the process, I was working on this art piece. And so at first, I was resisting, like when you're so involved with somebody working on their pain, it really affects your psyche. And it kept sort of coming through in this art piece, and it bugged me. And so I was trying to dismiss it and get back to work. And then finally I realized it wasn't going away, and so I started to see how it was very much a part of what was happening. And so first off, her shattering, the divorce, it's the lightning, and breaking open. And then there was the vulnerability, and it seemed like with every new layer, there'd be this conversation that was correspond. And I can't say I fully understand the whys of that kind of thing, but there's something when the universe supports where we are, when you don't have a reference point, when you're not that official doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, it's like the gods are saying, all is well. And there's no better acknowledgement. And I think for me, I just know I'm on the beam when that kind of thing happened, and it did for this. So each layer was very connected. There's this naked raw vulnerability that happened for her. And then there's the place of death, death rebirth, the place where all is lost and there's surrender. There's nothing else to be done. And then from there, she needed to get back into the world, back into the action of being present in her life in a way that took will and determination. And so this figure with the sword represented some of that, which was the sleeping warrior. And then the final place that place of surrender and resolve, of being, which there's no better gift to our process than to simply be who we are. You know, you think of all the things we try to do to be. We get tattoos, we get hairdos, we wear particular clothes because we want to be individuals when the true being is that innocent vulnerability that is at one with ourselves, basically, which is so hard to achieve children embody that, but it's not their own. How do we grow younger and become that consciously with a fierce determination that has a will of steel that can hold that conscious innocence? To make it our own, to be wise like the devil, see it all, but to hold that place of innocence and vulnerability, to be available. Nothing so awesome as a mountain because it's so conspicuous. What happens when you have nothing else to hide? But you're wise enough to have been through the suffering of naivete. It's what Christ said, suffer until you come unto me. It's just the inevitable process. We have this original innocence. We lose it with our ideas, our teaching, all that comes through to us. And then if we can make it our own, that's real. It's complete. It's interesting that you mentioned that because this morning when I was going in and I was sharing with you guys the quote from Marie-Louise von Franz around 
that every civilization needs a myth to live, mm -hmm. and then talking a little bit further about you when he said, it's not that the scriptures no longer give us the answer, the whole fault lies with us for not developing them further. Mm -hmm. The next quote that I didn't share with that <laughs> was he uses the example there where he says, be the wisest serpent, but harmless as doves. Mm -hmm. So he takes that as an example, and then he poses the question, why do we need to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves? Be the innocence and stay open in your heart and be aware of the horrific and the awesome mm -hmm. truth. Yeah, and the manipulations and all the people's fear that gets projected onto us that we end up getting angry at. How do we hold all of that? Hold that place of innocence? It takes a lot. I should tell a little Hindu tale here. It applies. There's a snake, a cobra, this little village that kills people, keeps biting people. So the people are terrified and people are dying and the snake is just having a great time. And one day a saint comes through the village and the snake says, aha, and he bites him and the saint just sort of reaches down, heals the wound and the snake says, oh shit, I just bit a saint. And so he repents and says, oh, Mr. Saint, what can I do? I'm, I shouldn't have done this and forgive me, I'll never go to Nirvana. And the saint said, well, stop biting people. And so the saint leaves and the snake says, well, that's easy. But the villagers quickly find out that this snake isn't biting him anymore. So they beat him with a stick and they kick him around and they take his food away. And so the poor snake is emaciated. The saint comes through the village again, sees this poor snake and says, well, what happened, Mr. Snake? And the snake says, well, you told me not to bite and look what they've done to me. And the saint said, but I didn't tell you you couldn't hiss. <laughs> so I think that's the wise devil part. Don't be afraid to hiss. It's not about being so good. So there's something about, again, that proximity to other. How much available and close are we going to be that the real healing comes through? Of course, the miracle says something like, when a healing moment happens, it happens for everyone. We don't go in as the knowing ones and work on somebody's healing. It just doesn't work that way. Otherwise, you might as well give them the clinical model. But what is healing but to be close enough, vulnerable enough in a situation where healing can come through? And in that moment, you might say, we all remember God. It's what it's all about. You know, we all remember we're more than just these bodies, you know, these decrepit, <laughs> decaying bodies. And to me, that kind of involvement, whatever we do, if we're stalking that larger mystery, that's what it's always about. It's about remembering. Because... It's not like we're going to take our wisdom and put it in our pocket and live it out in some kind of a way that's absolute. It's more like wisdom is knowing enough to be available for continual healing, continual remembering, because we will forget. We get bored and unhappy and we forget who we are and then something will inspire us again. How do you live that inspiration? Again, it comes down to living the sacred, living into that relationship with the unknown and allow it to know you, allow us to know it. I know that you're doing some art project. Is there anything you'd like me to address on that front? Well, maybe at some point while you're talking, if there's anything you can say to, that might feel supportive for the students um, in helping them understand, because they worked very hard at creating And you know that in advance. They know that in advance. But you have more than I had. I didn't know it in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know anything that you can share yeah. around that moment or that process that might help support them in the strength that it takes to, for that letting go of something. Sacrifice means to make sacred. And when we put what we love, our creation, we're all creating something. If we can put it on the altar with the willingness to let it go forever, and sometimes it is literal, like in my case. Other times it's like in the Bible where whoever it was was going to kill their child and the angel intervened. Somehow it's letting the gods know you mean business. In other words, I know at my best I'm going to do a lousy job holding this thing I love, whether it's our children or our work 
or our partner. I mean, when you think about it, it's our attachment that destroys more in our life than our willingness to let it go. There's sacrifice. The willingness to let it go is like putting it into God's hands. Or it's like giving it over to the mystery who knows better than we do how to carry our life. How do we do that? And so it's the things we love the most that we hold back the most. I mean, I remember literally saying as a young artist, I will do anything, but I'm always going to paint. So wouldn't you know, that would be the thing that the gods called up for attention. And I think it applies to all of us. And if you think about the way we raise our children, we'll be so attached to doing it right and to being in control. The very thing we're doing becomes destructive. The kids end up hating us for that control. They never learn to trust anything larger than us or their own fear-driven controls. And so we actually do a disservice. What if we could trust enough and interact with something larger than our own will, intelligence, and good intention to help us raise that child? What comes is a child who knows how to rely on the mystery, a child who has a relationship with the mystery. Not like we're teaching the child that, but we are an example of it by way of saying, I don't know. I don't know how to do you. I can't even do myself, but let's find out together. Think about that. That's very different from control. And then you discover and oh wow, isn't this mysterious? Isn't this magical? And you're awed together. That's a gift. This I just finished not long ago. It's called Nurse Log. Do you know what a Nurse Log is? When they cut trees from the old growth forest, the stumps sometimes can last a hundred years and a new tree will grow out of the nourishment of its substance, and so life comes up out of the death. I have two brothers, and it's my younger brother who died. And he was very handsome and charming, and so he had the doors open pretty easily, so he never did much with his life because it was too easy to have fun. And he went that route. And during his death, I've never felt so close to my younger brother in that process. And I really stalked this one because what often happens is the people we are the closest to, we can often do the least for. We can meet a stranger and we can do all kinds of incredible things. And yet the people we're closest to, there's no way in. And I really stalked his death. I watched it, I prayed, I invoked. And interestingly enough, we have this incredible Buddhist community on the island and they did a whole thing around his dying to support me. And I ended up in Albany doing this presentation, and there was this huge gathering, and a woman who I had dinner with offered to do this prayer with this huge group, and I really felt like it worked. And what was impossible about my relationship with my younger brother was there was no way in. Life was too easy. And yet, at the end, it was such a moment. But again, there's that place of sacrifice because I was really pretty hooked on trying to be positive in all this and yet the final moment I had to say you're dying there's nothing else that's it and that was really a hard transition you know to go from hope and possibility to okay dying is the name of the game let's do it together so there's a kind of metaphoric death of control death of ego to be able to enter even death with another and I think that is the ultimate gift that can only come with fully traversing the territory of your own metaphorical death. And what does that death look like? It's different for each of us. I mean, the thing that is our false God will fail. That thing that we think life will be good if I can only hold on to this or if I can only have this, that's usually the thing that fails. Our security, one way or another, gets undermined and we're devastated. Again, if there's either a God of everything or a God of nothing, how do you fully traverse the territory and find the gift in that worst case scenario? And when you can fully cover that ground, what emerges is in Christianity, the resurrection. For Buddha, it was the moment before enlightenment. But what comes through is like a promise and it's bedrock. That promise is when that death comes around in the cycle, which it will, you'll always remember and fall into the place where you can arrive at that renewal again and again. That's eternity. That moment is the eternal. It's eternal renewal. It's the nature of all things. And we spend our lives buffering ourselves 
from that moment. Most of us do. We have big bank accounts, we want more. We have big houses, we have 2.1 kids. Everything we have is to buffer ourselves from the void, from that emptiness, when in fact our own true happiness and liberation comes in befriending that emptiness and allow it to emerge with that new way of being. And I think, but who knows, even in literal death, that will happen. I don't know how, but I know in my own journey, everything I walked into that looked like death had a gift. And I don't know if there's any game in town better than that one, because it's not the happy things that make us happy. It's the things that we're afraid of that we conquer. It's those moments that we rise above where real joy comes. There's no other freedom. Free is being in the worst case scenario and finding beauty, being able to love other people, being able to love the moment, love ourselves and come out of it like a lotus in the mud to turn it into a flowering. This piece was really hard to do because I just wasn't into it. I kept feeling the positiveness of it. Just, it felt like the propaganda that it was. It was almost like I was trying to consciously rise above watching my brother lose it in increments. He was doing less and less. When you're that close to it, it's not easy, as I'm sure some of you have experienced the death of a loved one. It brings it home in a way that surprised me. I'm like Mr. Death. (laughs) Sometimes people call me that. Well, I visited my brother upstate New York. He he had cancer. And so I visited him several times. The last time... I was there for a few days, and I was getting ready to leave, and he has an eight-year-old son who had this huge television, and he was playing this crashing video car game, and so it was like cars are crashing, and his mother was sitting there commenting on his bad driving, and so I had to leave in a few minutes, and I knew I would probably never see him again. I wanted to ask him to turn off the television. But it felt like interference. I thought, well, this is the God of the moment. Again, you know, it's, you don't know. You're stalking the mystery. I wanted to control it, but I let it go. The moment I let it go, television went off. The boy went outside. His wife went into the kitchen. And it was just my brother and I. And I turned to him and I said, Jack, you know, I have to leave. So I had to drive back down to New York City and take a flight home. And he said, will I see you again? And we just looked at each other, and I couldn't answer because we both knew I wouldn't. And in that moment, we just both held each other and cried. So after that, we talked. I went outside to go, and I just sat in the car so opened by that experience, and I just sat and I held the space to feel what was going on. I couldn't drive this way. And when I looked up, he was on the porch waving. I took a picture of him before I left, knowing I'd never see him again. And then I stayed in touch by phone, and we had some good conversations, but for the most part, just surfacey. But, you know, it was that hopeful propaganda that I was a little bit hooked by myself. And and him hooked by wanting it, but there was no real depth connecting. And at one point, my older brother, who was with him, called me, and Jack wanted to talk to me. So we spoke, and he was at the edge of the edge. I immediately got a hit that he was really stuck. He couldn't go back to life, and he couldn't die. And he was on that edge, and it was so enormously difficult. And that's where I tossed hope to the wind, and I said, Jack, you are dying. There's nothing else to do. I named the beast. But part of naming it was becoming it myself, jumping in with him. And then I was shooting from the hip. I talked about the inherent loneliness, how we're all alone in this world. And then at the end, because he's been a complainer, as I said earlier, I said, Jack, you have been so incredibly brave. You've done this so well. You're such a good example to all of us of how to do this death thing. And I said, you've become my hero. And so in saying that, his response was, I didn't want my family to suffer. And then he burst into tears because I think he was holding this suffering quietly. And even his wife was like gung-ho on the, he's a trooper. At that point, dying is dying, and it's not fun. When do you turn into it? And that's where he was stuck. 
He died the next day. We both just surrendered into that thing. And, and again, we can't do that if death is still a boogeyman in our own life. And I mean metaphoric, and it's indistinguishable. You might say, well, anybody can die metaphorically, but that's not true because why do people commit suicide? Because it's easier to kill your body than it is to have your psyche go through a death, your ego go through a death. And so how do we do that? And how can we be that kind of available even in the face of death? Because that's where it counts. The places that are terrifying to most of us are the places that need healing. And they're collectively enormous, those places. And death is certainly one of them. So it was just very much a healing. And then this art piece that I was quite bored with just didn't cut it. And so and then I added uh, another face over it, which opened up. And that felt a little closer to home. It was starting to feel a little more transpersonal. But it still didn't work. It still felt in the realm of propaganda. And then I just got this intuitive hit at the end to put this huge hand-hewn spike through the hand. And it just felt like that moment I jumped into my brother's death. It was like saying, I'm not in control of this death. I can't avoid it with my good intentions. It was an act of faith. It was that jump in the cycle back into the inevitable. And in doing it, I felt it was the inspiration. Now it says what it needs to say. But I think also for myself, it was saying, I'm here for all of it, not just the good part. <laughs> I am here for all of it, because I know I'm going to be my brother dying someday. We all are. How do you deal with that? How do you say yes to that? How do you say that too is a miracle that's part of the plan? It's not avoidable, so what is the alternative? Denial, and to live that fear your whole life? I'd rather deal with that now and live beautifully. That's what it means to embrace the metaphoric death process. This piece is a lot of what I've been talking about. I call the sacred wound. And the orange part is the hood from a 1941 case tractor. <laughs> when you take something in that you love so completely, whether it's fashion or a particular look, or it could be anything. And somehow, if you really take it in and appreciate the incredible internal beauty of it, somehow it's going to manifest. And for me, I remember the Ice Man was discovered. And I so was taken by that image when I was younger. And I think it really came out in this piece. So I call it the sacred wound. The gift of the sacred wound, it gets back to that metaphoric death, which is symbolized in many forms. The ego is always going to scramble to survive. It's always going to find some really clever way to pop its head back up. The sacred wound is the memory of that holy defeat, the place where you're not going to survive this one. You know, your ego is in the dust with this thing that happened in your life, and you will always remember that. And in that, you're more prayerful, you're more reverent, there's some trepidation about the ego having too much power because you know how miserably it has failed you. And so the sacred wound is the memory of holy defeat. And somehow creating this piece really defined that for me. And, and so if you know the place you need to surrender again, you value the defeat. You no longer avoid it. So Jerry, this really has that, um, I don't know, the image in the face. Can you explain that? I took in the image of death so completely. It's a way of looking at death in the eye because it's a very death-like face. I don't know much more than that, except that I took in the image of that ice man, and I think it came out. I think it needed to be literal. Like I know when I was younger and painting in the studio, I would paint things that I was afraid of. I contemplated suicide as a young man, and I would do paintings of suicide. I did a series on insanity because I didn't know if I was crazy or not. I mean, most of us don't know. That's why we're so desperately normal, because we don't want to think that maybe I'm crazy. Or If you abandon your crazy, you abandon 90% of the mystery. If crazy means out of control, congratulations. You shouldn't be in control. You should have a relationship with the mystery that is in control. So it was a way of naming the beast and getting close to it in a way that was liberating for me. I'm curious, this piece stands out to me just a little bit because it's the only one that I've seen that has a masculine figure in it instead of feminine. Is that, mm. do you tend to do, is it just the ones that I've seen or is it they, are they 
more often than in the years. Look, a big part of my own journey was certainly embracing the feminine. Yogananda says, know the male, you know, be wise like the devil and be the female. In other words, what's female? It's the receptive, it's the space, it's the vehicle for creation. It's, you know, it's a channel for, for life, for new life. And, and what Yogananda goes on to say is we're all feminine in the eyes of God, basically. So we're all receptive. That's probably a big part of it. I think I probably carry more feminine. I mean, people tell me I do all the time. But I think it's just a big part of what I've become when it wasn't who I was in the studio. I mean, if there was ever a blind, driven will, I mean, I was it. I was so driven at the expense of everything. Painting was it, and everything else fell to the wayside, which is totally lopsided. Life is like juggling pins. They all have to be accounted for. If we say, I only want to hold on to this one, yeah, the others come down on their head, which they constantly did for me finally beat me into the ground <laughs> where I had to figure out relationship, <laughs> all the things I couldn't control. So this is earlier work. I just thought I'd share some of this. A big part of what was going on before I destroyed my work was that split that most of us live. That place where at some level black and white, good and bad, and we don't know a whole lot about the place they come together because we can't control that place. Yogananda says, to set out on any holy purpose and to die along the way is to succeed. And so there's this place where that metaphor of death, the place where we can't do anymore with our will, intelligence, and good intention, is the place duality comes together. And what I see in my earlier work, as I said I was trying to paint my way to heaven, I was battling the opposites. Things are so fragmented. I was trying to do what was impossible. And what I'm here to say is you can't get there from here by way of anything we have available. It comes in surrender. And I think that's the gift of the metaphoric death experience. Much more fleshy coloring than your, your newer pieces. They were very colorful. You were living uh, in your loft when you destroyed it? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And it started out so, oh, here's my false god, I couldn't do it. But as I began, I just felt so liberated. My wife ran women's spiritual growth groups for many years. She used to hand out these comics to sort of help with the process. And one of them was a woman standing on the edge of a precipice saying, I, I can't do it, I can't do it. The next frame was, I can do it, I can do it. And then the third frame is her jumping over the precipice and landing and exhilarated. And then she says, what did I do? <laughs> I think destroying the work was like that for me. It was so completely liberating. But then the reality of who am I with nothing, sheer terror. It's like being thrown overboard on a boat. You're not going to learn another medium, which is water, if you're not in it swimming. And I think I was like thrown in. And now I have to learn to swim in this emptiness, find meaning, find life. And that was a huge part of the journey seeing the gift of the metaphor death experience. Again, there's the sacrifice. You put your life on the altar. There's somehow, there's no other way to know the larger truth of who we are if we don't put ourselves in the hands of alchemy, of the alchemical process, of the transformational process, whatever you want to call it. How do we do that? We can't do it with good intentions. With your interest in Jung, there's an interesting phenomenon that happened in Seattle with the Jungian training program. There was a time when the women involved were getting these strange diseases and even dying. The Jungian scene, it's very brilliant, intelligent, deep. If you use your mind and your will and your good intention, it will get as close to heaven's gate, you might say, as you can get with what you have available. If you push that control to the place where you can't get any further, I think that's where life starts to fail. And if we can embrace that failure, there's the sacred wound. And we think it's a life failure, but in fact, it's the beginning. Again, to die along the way is to succeed. That's the edge of our ultimate success. And what I see, and I could be completely wrong, it's my total opinion, 
I saw, especially the women who were more embodied, their bodies were failing. They feel, they knew it. It wasn't working for the women. I think the men can just keep banging their head on the gate. I almost issue it as a, perhaps a warning, but mostly as an inspiration. Embrace the failure of all your good intentions with your work with Jung. Because Jung did it, you know, he set off alone and naked and he did what no one else did. Let him be the example, not his teachings, not what Jungians are telling you. Let him be the example. Do what he did. If you want to see a place with no reference point, he is the man. He had nothing to refer to that defined where he was going. That's what all of our journeys will look like if we go to the depths of our soul work. And the interesting thing about jumping overboard in the way I described is that it looks so impossible for us to do, but that's actually good news because what you don't know until you jump is that that's the place where the universe comes in to support you. The place that you're most afraid of, if you can make yourself vulnerable to it, the universe supports you. And then you know life is being held. But in the beginning, you've got life and death right next to each other, and it's so terrifying. You're still in that jerky place of, am I alive or am I not? Or, Do I exist or don't I exist? And I think any journey worth its salt, certainly a journey of depth which you are all pursuing, you're dabbling with some pretty wonderful, terrifying experience. You're saying yes to something that we're all here to do, and incredibly, you at least have found the courage to turn into it, however much or little. It's good, powerful work, and know you need the universe's support in really completing it, because you won't do it from the book. So is this your kitty cat? That was my cat, Jasmine. I had to give her away because I was fasting all the time. She didn't like fasting. <laughs> but I gave all my money away and took whatever came. But you did that a really long time. Yeah, that was a really long time. I, I did. The initial month, but 15 years. Well, in some way, I'm still doing it. Money comes. Coming here, I felt so honored to be asked. And I said yes, but I was really hesitating because Marilyn just lost her job and I didn't know how I was going to do it. And this person who had supported the film in the past, his wife was very wealthy and she had died. Marilyn does home and family funerals. She did her funeral. And I knew he was struggling financially now because the family left him in a funny position. And so we invited him over to support him. I made him a nice dinner and and so we were there to support this poor guy who was struggling financially. And before he leaves, he says, oh, do you guys need any money? Ellen left me with this Tides Foundation money, and I have to give it all away this year. And do you need any money? <laughs> and, you know, Marilyn, who's always so shy around accepting, said, yes. <laughs> I never saw her do that before. <laughs> oh. So he's funded this trip to be here. This was an interesting story with the early self-portrait I did. It was a great failure in perfection. I learned something doing this. I think I was 20 years old when I did it. I'd only done one other painting, and this was the second painting. But I tried so hard. And if any of you are artists, you know you can really get hooked by getting it right, so much so that you often will abandon it because you're so overwhelmed by the overwhelming details of possibility that are actually in reality. How do you duplicate that? And I got so hooked by trying to get everything in this painting that I really had something of a breakdown. I couldn't make it perfect. So much so that my mother, who worked at a hospital, asked their social workers to talk to me because I was really struggling. Again, there's what happens when you take will, intelligence, and good intentions too far. There's no such thing as that kind of perfection. In fact, imperfection is written in. It's Christ in the garden before the crucifixion. It's Buddha before enlightenment. It's that place where we say, do I really have to do this? It's that place of doubt. These were panels painted on both sides. It was that duality. I was calling them angels and demons. So there were dark figures, light figures. And they hung 10 and 10 on a single cord and they would spin angels turning into demons. There were 80 of those panels. Wow. 
So in your book, you mentioned you were coming home, I guess it was the middle of the night or something, and a whole group of young African-American men on your doorstep. And you took them into your loft, you did that trusting, and allowed them in. Was this the body of work you showed them? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because <laughs> 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 they were that certainly helped us more. Jerry, having destroyed your work, how do you now feel about these lasting representations, these images? It's no big deal. It's fun playing with it all. The gift that came out of it so overrode the matter of it. Einstein says matter never dies, it just changes form. I really feel like the form that emerged was being, something I knew nothing about. And it so overrode the matter of it. And I didn't have photographs. Mark Sedan, who made the first film, which is incorporated into In the Hands of Alchemy, a few years ago, he said he had all these pictures that he took when he was filming earlier on, and he sent them to me. So I wouldn't even have the images. But it's all kind of fun now. My foundation is in the place of renewal. And I don't depend on anything else. And so this is all just grist for the mill. I feel this place in my life coming from such emptiness where I didn't even talk for a year. And little by little, the film was made, then the parabola film, and then I was asked to write a book. And now there's a feature film being made about my story. And so the return to the world feels so natural and easy and organic. If you have found something that's useful and the world needs it, you put whatever it takes into the pot to make a wholesome meal. It's just more ingredients to the totality of the story, which is fun to play with. We can't just do nothing with our lives and sit there and expect heaven to come through because it's not going to happen. we got to give it our best. We've got to believe in something with all our heart and soul, whatever it is, whether it's our children or our work. We've got to do it with everything we've got. And I think all of that is what transforms into the new emergent form. You know, I think there's an interesting way, kind of going back to the time invested in the projects and the art pieces that were destroyed, and how matter never dies, it changes form. Time never dies, it changes form. It's almost as if the time that was invested, now you have a capacity that a very few people that I know to be in a very timeless space. Talk about that a little bit, entering into that space that feels like eternity it feels like it warps and changes time and space. Yeah. Well, if you think about time and space, it's most often in relation to our boredom or our busyness, our ideas of what we think we need to be doing, or we, you know, we have too much time that we don't know what to do with. Somehow, timeless space is the place of prayer, the place of reverence, the place of awe with the universe, where something is happening that's keeping your attention. It is timeless, because time is like what you do when you have nothing to do. That's all the realm of time. Space and time, when it disappears, it's attention. It's pure attention. It's so in the moment with what is, and there's nothing better. There's nowhere you would rather be. That's timeless. It's like any discipline. We need to cultivate that which we value. If you value shoes, you're going to be like Marcos with 10,000 pairs of shoes. If you value timeless, creative space, that's what you get. We get what we ask for, but how many of us are asking for anything of real value? If you have found that timeless, creative soul connection, then you can do the world because it doesn't matter. It gets back to your question of seeing the art. I'm doing art again. I'm married. I was celibate for 12, 13 years. I'm back in the world because it doesn't matter. Most of us are doing what we do because it matters so much. In time and space, we're trying to survive. If I don't, who will kind of attitude. If you don't, God will. The universe will. And then you can be in the world because it doesn't matter. You want to make a million dollars. You want a beautiful relationship. I mean, I feel like everything that is so beautiful in my life, my wife who I adore, my life, our place where we live, it's all there because it doesn't matter if it is or not. It's almost like the moment it came in was the moment it didn't matter. Because when a thing is at that place, 
what you're saying is the plan of the universe matters more than my idea of what I think I want. And there is a whole other attitude. What is your plan, universe? What do you want from me? I want to participate in that. Therein lies our happiness, our power, our purpose in life. Everything comes out of that relationship, that stance. That's our choice. We can either have what we want, which is nothing, or we could have what we are, which is everything. I think you just answered all my questions of the universe with that last statement. <laughs> You're a cheap date. <laughs> You know, sometimes it takes two hours of talking to get to the point. I'm glad it did that for you. I liked what you said there at the end. And it reminded me of something that I struggle with today is that I can ask for the prayer, and I know it's being prayed for me, but the struggle that I have in the human experience is I know it will be answered, it's just that I don't always know when. Yeah, that's the wild card. That's what, that's hard for all of us, you know, like we want what we want now in the form we want it. That's not exactly it. Everything we ask for in the place of reverence comes through somehow. I mean, it could be, you know, a bicycle for the poor neighbor. It may not come because you have the money to buy it. But all of a sudden, you'll see this kid with a bicycle. I mean, it could be as ridiculous or as simple as that. Brother David Stendelroth talks about gratefulness. There's something about tending the gifts that come and seeing them with gratefulness that helps us to see how they manifest. And it's the ego that wants them the way they want them. I want the money to buy the neighbor a bicycle because then I will be a good guy in the neighborhood or whatever. And there's something about seeing the way the gift comes through. You just ask for joy, and you might find that it's come, but you were so busy doing other things, you didn't notice the way it came through. And so you couldn't experience the gratefulness, which brings even more, whereas the answer to your prayer can be your life, a life of prayer, a life of living the prayer each moment, where it's not like praying like a beggar, it's like praying like an open reverence to the incredible mystery of possibility in all times. That is the answer to our prayers in the end. It gets back to the cycle of birth and death, which we're really looped in. Look at nature, look at the moon, name it. It's all doing it. How do we think we're going to be different? A big part of our suffering, our prayerful request, is to really let go in that place of surrender. And so, if we're doing it with all sparkly good intentions, it's still not surrender. Surrender is surrender. I can't do any more. I might die here in this hard place. Give yourself even to that because there is where it comes. Mr. Jerry Wilson. Thank you all very much.